So in Acts chapter 2 there, um, the believers there, are, they're gathered together in one accord. And what happens is there's a sound of a mighty wind like rushing in and it fills the place where they are. And there's like fire sitting on each person's head, like cloven tongues of fire. And the multitude, he must have heard this and maybe saw it through the windows. And they come under, they all, the whole multitude comes there. And so Peter starts preaching to them the gospel. Right in verse 21, he tells them, And it shall come to pass, and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He, he's quoting some Old Testament and telling people that about Jesus Christ and how his soul went to hell and that he, he was the Messiah. And, and in verse 37, people, they, their hearts were pricked, right? They, they, they realized it's true. And, and they asked, What shall we do? And in, in verse 38, Peter tells them, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So the title of my sermon this morning is, Why Should I Get Baptized? Why Should I Get Baptized? And I, I have gotten baptized, but people, new believers, might be thinking to themselves, Why should I get baptized? And we're going to go through the reason why somebody should get baptized. And number one, Peter preached this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. That's, he mentioned that was one of the first few things that they should do. It is a commandment of God. It says repent and be baptized. But people will twist this. People will twist this and say, this is a requirement for salvation. It is not a requirement of salvation to get baptized. The way I grew up, there was a big emphasis on baptism. Make sure you got baptized before you die, because otherwise you'd be lost. You'd go to hell. That's what, that, that's what we were taught. And obviously, that's false. The Bible doesn't teach that. And among the Mennonites, that's, that's a big concern. That you, you know, in, in German, they said dyke. Which, dyke is deep, so that should tell you how you get baptized. But they, they even make, in their churches, people have to be baptized before they get married. And which isn't a bad idea that because you don't want to be unequally yoked. But they, they, they don't understand baptism at all because they take it as to salvation. But some people say, well, didn't Peter right here talk about being baptized for the remission of your sins. You have to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. So what is the remission of sins? That is the forgiveness of sins. But notice, he says, repent. Now, some people want to say, this means repent of your sins. Right? See? Repent of your sins, be baptized, and your sins are forgiven. Right? No, that's not what I mean. That's wrong. Repent means to repent of your unbelief. Okay, and believe. Because if repent in this passage, in this verse 38, means to repent of your sins, where's the gospel? If repent doesn't mean to believe, to quit believing the false thing, and start believing the right thing, where's the gospel? He's not telling them to believe and be baptized. He's saying repent. Well, repent means repent of... of Putting your faith in you being a child of Abraham or a child of Israel, put your faith in Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins. He even talked about, prior to this, he talked about Jesus' soul going to hell. So this repent here is talking about um, repent of what you believe in and, and believe the right thing. And... So they had to believe and they had to be baptized. Baptism wasn't part of the remission of sins. Okay? They had to repent. They had to repent of their, their unbelief and believe. And then they were saved. But they should also get baptized. That was also a commandment. Like, you believe and then you get baptized. That's the order. Okay? In verse 41 it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. So they received it. They believed it. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Just imagine that. Peter's preaching there was powerful in God's word, right? And 3,000 people believed and got baptized. I believe most of them, because it says, probably all of them, because it says, they that gladly received his word were baptized. 
And so some people, they don't quite get this about the repentance. You know, they say, well, John preached the baptism of repentance, right? Mark 1, verse 4 and 5, the Bible says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out on to all the land of Judea, and they of Jerusalem were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And people want to place emphasis on repenting of your sins compared to actually believing on Jesus Christ. And they say that, you know, that's what John taught, right? You have to quit sinning. You have to turn from your sin, or at least be willing, right? And we will see here in a little bit, that's not what John was preaching at all, okay? In Luke 3, uh, verse 3, something similar. And he came into all the country of Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So if the baptism of repentance is not repenting of your sins, what is it? I think I already said it. It's repenting of your unbelief. In Acts chapter 19, verse 4, you might as well turn there if you're still in Acts, it tell, Paul explains what this baptism of repentance is that John preached. And it is not repenting of your sins. Acts 19, verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. See, that's what we keep hearing about, right? Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. See, the baptism of repentance is repenting from what you believe to believing the true gospel. He, he, you know, Paul says, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto people, so this is what he preached, that they should believe on him that which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. In Luke uh, 3, verse 7 and 8, the Bible says, Then said to the multitude that came forth to be baptized them, this is John baptizing here now, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring therefore fruits worthy of repentance. See, you got to repent of your sins. People will say, No. Keep reading. And begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So what they were supposed to repent of is having their faith in who their dad was. And they were supposed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Another verse that people want to bring up about the baptism is, is something that is required for salvation is Mark 16, 16. And a lot of times people don't even know where it's found. Um, it was last Sunday, I was talking to a lady and and she seemed to finally get that about eternal security. And then I just, just to check, uh, it's just believe. You don't have to get baptized. No, you have to get baptized too. And, you know, people, are, some of them are thinking about this verse, but they don't know where it is. It's Mark 16, 16. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, that's similar to what we read there in Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized. It just, they throw that baptized in there right after, but that's not the part that gets you saved. That's just something you do when you're saved. Because when it says here in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. I can tell you, he that believeth and eats jalapenos shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Not be true. Okay? Because the... And notice the second part of 1616, 16, it says, He that believeth not shall be damned. It doesn't say, He that is not baptized shall be damned. He that baptized is, is not baptized shall be damned. It doesn't say that. So he that believeth then goes skydiving and say, But he that doesn't believe is going to hell. It doesn't matter what you add on to the end of that. Believe and do whatever else. Okay? Whatever else is possible for a believer to do shall be saved, but he that believeth not is down. So that verse does not teach you have to get baptized to be saved. John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. So, if John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but somebody that believes and is not baptized, they're not going to hell. They are going to heaven. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's nothing to do with baptism. Baptism is something you do after we're saved. Another uh, passage people have problems with is 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's go there. 1 Peter chapter 3. So the, the first thing 
I want to do is debunk, and I've started already, is to debunk this idea that why we get baptized is because we want to be saved. Obviously, I'm talking to mainly saved people here, but you'll run across this of soul winning, and you need to be able to show people, no, it's not required for salvation. It's, it's something that we do out of obedience. First Peter, First Peter chapter 3, starting verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We should always be ready to give somebody the gospel. Okay? Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well doing than for evil doing. Verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, verse 18 he will be uh, very important here in a couple of verses. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, who sometimes were disobedient, and once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. And verse 21 is one they have the problem with. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities, and powers being made subject unto him. So they want to say, see, baptism does now save us. Now if you look closely at 21, what do you see there? You see a couple of parentheses or brackets, right? And when something is in brackets like that, to understand it, I think a good way is you read it once without the brackets, and then you read it with the brackets, because that anything in brackets is additional information. Okay? So if we would read it that way, it says the light figure, so figure is like a, a sign or, or a picture of, right? The light figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So baptism isn't what saves us, it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but baptism is a figure of that. Remember verse 18, Christ, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, just for the unjust, that he may bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Baptism symbolizes Jesus being put to death, being buried, and rose again. That's what baptism represents. And when we get baptized, we're showing you know, showing that we agree with that and that we are saved. So, baptism does not save us. It's the light figure of what does save us, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you want to say that bap this means baptism does saves us, what about verse, end of verse 20, where it talks about Noah, and it says, eight souls were saved by water. You mean, they get to go to heaven because he got on the boat? No, I don't think so. Because what about Ham, and the wicked things he did once he was off the boat? I believe Ham was a reprobate. But Noah's family got to go on the boat because he was the righteous, most righteous man on the earth and God saved his family as well. So when eight souls were saved by water, they were saved from death. Okay, physical death, not hell. And I believe there was people that were on the earth that, that just they weren't zealous enough according to knowledge and they didn't bother getting on the boat. But they were still saved. They just, they just died. Okay, they still got to go to heaven because they were saved. So, baptism does not save us. It is the picture of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. When somebody gets put down in the water, that's signifying Jesus' death. When they're in the water, that's being signifi signifying that, that Jesus is burial, right? They're all the way in the water, just like Jesus was all the way in the tomb. And then they're raised again. That's like Jesus' resurrection came out of the tomb. In Colossians 2, verse 12, it says, Bury with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God that raised him from the dead. So baptism symbolizes the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So people that want to say that you have to get baptized to be saved, they're wrong. And these are all good verses here uh, that I showed you. Some of them are just verses that people twist, but you can see how they're wrong about it. But 
I think it's very simple. You go to 1 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 14, and all the way to 17, and you can see that Paul did not preach baptism as part of salvation. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 14, Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Gaius. So if it was a requirement to get saved, it's to get baptized. Why would he thank God that he didn't baptize anybody? Just like he didn't get anybody saved except for Crispus and Gaius. He wouldn't be thanking God then for that. Because it's just not part of salvation. Lest any should say that I baptize my own name, and I baptize also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. Now pay attention to verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now with the wisdom of words, thus the cross of Christ should be made a manifest. So he's saying, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but he did send me to preach the gospel. Now, what's the gospel? It's how you get saved. Now, being baptized is part of how you got saved. And why is he saying, he didn't send me to baptize, but he did send me to preach the gospel? If baptism was part of it, then he did send me to be baptized, but he didn't. Okay? So, it's perfectly clear here, Paul knew that baptism was not, not part of salvation. In Romans 10, you know, it, it's very clear. We'll be going through that in a few Thursdays. It's very clear what Paul preached. Okay? In Romans 10, 8, the Bible says, But what say it that the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart? That is the word of faith which we preach. And then he goes on to explain what the word of faith is that he preached. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath risen from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And that's the gospel that Paul preached. Okay? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Guess what? If baptism was part of getting saved, and you had believed on Jesus Christ, you asked him to save you, but you never got baptized, you'd be ashamed at the resurrection, if that was part of it, right? But it says here, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Nobody that believes. Even people that did, disobeyed and didn't get baptized. Let's go to uh, Acts chapter 16. So Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31 is popular when you're preaching the gospel, right? Because it's so clearly asked what a person has to do to do to be saved. You know, Paul and Silas are thrown in prison and then God makes an earthquake happen. And obviously a jailer got scared and he probably thought, well, maybe what these guys are preaching is true. And then he wants to know, right? Verse 30, and you brought and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So here's Paul. He's about to preach the gospel. Okay? Not just Paul. It says they. So Silas do. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. No mention of baptism. Paul preached the gospel, and the guy didn't get saved. And he spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all of his, straightly. So, and when he had brought them into his house, he set, set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God and all his house. So when verse 31 says, Now shalt be saved in thy house, it's like, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be saved. And then if your, the rest of your house believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved as well. And we see here, they believed and they got baptized. And it says straightway, you believe, get baptized as soon as possible. That's what the Bible teaches. So if we don't need baptism for salvation, it's not required for salvation. And we don't need baptism to wash away our sins. Why would a person get baptized? It's because you are saved. And God commanded it. It's because. Remember in Acts 2.41. They, when they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day were added on to them by 3,000 souls. So why should you get baptized? Because it's commanded and because you are saved. That is why. And it's taught, you know, throughout the Bible, how that Jesus commanded the disciples to go back teaching the gospel and baptizing. And that's why baptism is sometimes mentioned in the same sentence. It's just because that's what they're commanded to do. Go preach the gospel and then baptize them as soon as they're saved. 
John 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, but Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. So, so Jesus told his disciples to baptize people, and then John heard... Sorry, when, when Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had baptized more uh, disciples than John. Okay? Although Jesus himself didn't uh, baptize them, he chose the twelve and he baptized them. Okay? And in uh, Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, right? Verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore. Um, Turn to Acts chapter 8 while I'm reading here in Matthew 28. Acts chapter 8. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So he, he told them, you know, go and teach all nations, you know, teach them the gospel, and then you baptize them. And then you teach them all things. That's the order, right? There's no use teaching them all things if they don't believe. Okay? And if they don't even understand that they should get baptized, that's the first step of obedience, then they don't even know the first step. You know, you're still going to teach them, right? You're not just going to preach on baptism every single Sunday. That wouldn't work. But at least you've taught them that, and then you can move on to the other things. So they were supposed to get... Uh, people saved and then baptize them and then teach them all things. So in Acts chapter 8 there we see an example of somebody getting baptized. Um, you know, God sends Philip to go talk to this Ethiopian eunuch. Let's start in verse 26 there. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south onto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Giza, which is desert. That's important that it was desert. Okay. So he probably has a water bottle with him at the minute. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture where he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before a shearer. So open he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation, for his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophetess, of, um, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began the same street, scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So he starts preaching him the gospel. And as they went on their way, they came onto a certain water. So it's some body of water, okay, either a river or a lake or a pond or something. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? You think, is, is there anything that's stopping me from getting baptized? And Philip said, If Thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. All right, so he says, what, did, what would stop me from getting baptized? And Philip asked, and basically says, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you believe with all your heart, and, and then he, he does say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So one person asks him, do you believe? And, and, and uh, the eunuch says, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then that Philip commands the chariot to stop, and he goes, they both get into the water, and they bat, uh, he baptizes his Philip. So the only requirement to being baptized, to getting baptized, is that you believe. And the other thing that this this uh, passage teaches is that you get dumped under water when you, you get baptized. Okay, Because if it was just sprinkling on the head, or just pouring on the head, like I got baptized in the Mennonite church, okay, 
then why do they have to wait until they get to a water, a certain water? Philip, or Philip might have as well, but the eunuch would have had water in his chariot. You know, if he's going through the desert, he would have had water. And you say, well, he didn't. He probably didn't. Well, then why, if he didn't, why didn't he just stand beside the body of water and scoop some up instead of going into the water? I don't know about you, but are you going to get wet unnecessarily unless you're going swimming? You're not going to do it, right? They go into the water. It said in verse 8, right? When pull down both into the water. And both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized And then 39, when they would come up out of the water, right? So they were in the water, they came out of the water. So that is the way the Bible teaches to be baptized, to get fully immersed. Because we're going to get to it a little bit, what does baptism symbolize? It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we see other examples of this. When people get baptized, they're going into the water. In Matthew 3, verse 5 and 6, And went out to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. They went into the river to get baptized. So that's the way John baptized. So if, if the dunking wasn't necessary, why didn't he just go to them and carry a jug of water with him? Okay? If that's all that was needed, he'd go around, get people saved, and just pour water on them or sprinkle them. But remember what the Ethiopian eunuch, he said, See, here's water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? So, why should we get baptized? Because we're saved. But if you're saved and you think you've been baptized, but you were not immersed, you were not baptized, you just got wet, it didn't, does not count, and you should get baptized. When Jesus got baptized, Matthew 3, verse 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. He got immersed. He was in the water. You say, well, he could have been just standing in the water, so he could have scooped water and poured it on him. Well, then why bother getting in the water? Just scoop some water and put some on somebody's head, and they don't have to get all wet. It's because, see, we don't understand Greek, okay? But it, the Greek speakers, they understand baptism, that, often, that means you get dunked underwater. That word means you get dunked. And even in low German, you know, the word, or, or in high German, Taufen, you know, and, and, and low German is diping. It, 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 you can see how that word comes from dipping or putting something, somebody in, in, in deep water, okay, like deep enough that they can get submerged. But we don't need a Greek dictionary, we don't need to you know, go to the, the etymology of a word or anything like that. But we can see from Scripture, every time they're going in the water, and then they come out of the water once they're done baptizing. The, the Bible teaches immersion. Uh, Colossians 2, verse 12, it says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God that raised him from the dead. We are buried with him in baptism. What does that mean? We're actually physically buried? No. This is we're symbolizing. Just like communion symbolizes Jesus' blood and his, his body, this symbolizes his death. And if, if you were symbolizing his death, do you think that Jesus, when, when they took his body, they just sprinkled some dirt on him or poured a pail of dirt on his head? No. They put him all the way in the tomb. He's totally surrounded. Okay? Just like even, and I don't have this in my notes, but it talks about the children of Israel. When they crossed the Red Sea, there was a cloud above them, and they had water on both sides. They were totally surrounded by water. That was a picture of baptism. And if this is, baptism is a symbol of people, uh, of Jesus being buried, then you don't symbolize that by just sprinkling or pouring. You, you, you dump somebody all the way under Romans 6, starting verse 3, it says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. So there it is again, buried with him by baptism. That light, so light, this is a picture of, light as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So there's the burial and the resurrection. And then, Look at verse 5, it's, it's very interesting. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, 
we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So, we talk about baptism, buried with him by baptism, and then he talks about planting, we're planted together in the likeness of his death. So now, when you plant a seed, you just sprinkle a little bit of dirt on it, or do you put it all the way into the dirt? You put it all the way in the dirt. Jesus' body didn't just get some dirt thrown on it, or a couple of rocks, or something like that. He got put all the way in the earth, in a, in a tube, huge out of rock. John 3, 22, 23, after these things, and Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon, you to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So that's why they're baptizing there, because there's a lot of water there. Now, if they're just taking a pitcher of water and pouring it on somebody a little bit, you know, the way I was baptized in the Mennonite church, you know, you put your hand on there and pour it so it doesn't run down. And just pour a little bit so your hair gets wet. Right? Well, that's not planting. And you, you wouldn't need much water if that's the way you do it. Sprinkling it or super soap or however you do it, you wouldn't need a lot of water that way. But if you dump something, you need enough to cover them. And the reason I say super soaker, I saw some kind of video or something, some Catholic priest, I guess because COVID didn't want to get so close or they're not doing things right. You say, okay, I understand the Bible teaches that we're supposed to be immersed. But my parents taught me that I would lose my salvation if, if I would get baptized again. Mine did also. That's what my parents taught me, right? And even after I believed that I could not lose my salvation, it's still in the back of my mind, like, yeah, but I'm somehow disrespecting God or something didn't feel right about it. Okay? And then my parents taught me you're not supposed to get baptized again. Well, first time I wasn't even baptized. Okay? It's not what the Bible taught me. And Acts 5.29, Peter says, okay? And Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Okay? Always obey your parents unless the Bible tells you something different. That's when you disobey. Okay? It's the only time you disobey. is when the Bible tells you something else. You say, well, I know I won't lose my salvation, but I still feel like I'm sinning. Well, we don't... You know what, as Christians, we don't live our lives by feelings. Put away that feeling. So many, like the Mormons, that, that feeling of the burning in their bosom, they look at where they are, they're going to hell if they don't believe on Jesus Christ. Put away that feeling. And they, they use this verse in Ephesians 4 or 5 to teach that you should never get baptized again. And it says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism. See? Only one baptism. They're, they're totally misunderstanding, right? They say, if you get baptized again, you're disrespecting God. Because you're saying that the first time it wasn't worth anything, it didn't mean anything, it was void. Well, if you got sprinkled or you got poured on, it doesn't mean anything. You just got wet. Okay, you weren't. You know, what about if you were baptized as a baby? Are you going to say, one baptism, I already got baptized, I can't get baptized again. But even the Mennonites teach that that isn't valid. And they will baptize somebody that got baptized as a baby. So they're using this verse to say that you should never get baptized again. It's false. Okay? Ah, 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 one baptism, right? Well, no, a baby, then it's okay for them, too. Okay? But it also says, this verse says one faith, right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So if you used to believe a different way to go to heaven, and now you believe a different, the actual Bible way to believe in heaven, are you disrespecting this verse? It says one Lord, one faithful in baptism. You used to believe a different way. And now you believe the right way. So are you disrespecting God that way? No, you're not. So to say that if you get baptized the way the Bible tells you, even though you got poured some water or sprinkled some water, that you're disrespecting God, you're not. Okay? That's not what this teaches. This just teaches that there is one Lord, right? And one faith and one baptism. But it doesn't teach that if you've got it done wrong, first of all, that you should never get it done right. Turn to Acts chapter 19, we'll see, and I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you that it is not wrong to get baptized again. So, I got poured on, they called it baptism. Okay? In the old colony, the Mennonite church. 
You say, why even go to old calling in the first place? Well, I grew up in a more liberal church, and I started reading the Bible, and I realized the stuff they were teaching in there was wrong, like ladies getting short hair and so on. And, well, I knew that was wrong, and I knew these other people, they didn't teach that. Well, they were just as bad, right, because they had the wrong salvation. But I got poured on, and they called baptism. But the Bible is clear, you need a lot of water to baptize someone, right? They, they, they baptize their in on your Salem because there's much water there. And if you got poured on, or you got sprinkled on, and, or any other way than the Bible teaches, you didn't get baptized, you got wet. If you were baptized as a baby, even if you got immersed, dunked in all the way, you were not baptized, you got wet. Even if as an adult you got immersed, but you were not saved, you did not get baptized. Let's face it, let's face it most of us that have been sprinkled or poured on, we weren't even saved when we got baptized. I know I wasn't. You know, you, when you got baptized, you probably believed you could lose your salvation. You probably believed you had to repent of your sins to be saved, or that you could lose your salvation, or, or something like that, right? Or you have to be baptized to get saved. You probably believe that. So if you believe anything other than what the, the salvation is taught, what the gospel is taught, you weren't actually baptized, you just got wet. Okay? You did not actually get baptized because you believe, you didn't believe in salvation the way the Bible teaches. When the Bible is clear, you get saved, and then you get baptized. Let's look at Acts chapter 19. Let's not just take my word for it. Acts 19, starting verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. And then here's that famous verse that teaches what John actually preached. Then said Paul, John, where they baptized at the baptism of repentance, saying on to the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men that were, and all the men were about twelve. So these 12, they got baptized, even though they had already been baptized by John. Okay? But why did they get baptized again? It's because John did it wrong? Well, I'm sure John immersed them. But it's because they didn't even know whether there was a Holy Ghost. They didn't understand the Trinity. So they weren't saved. So they weren't even saved. So John, or sorry, Paul goes and Paul or one of the disciples there baptizes them. Okay? They weren't saved when they got baptized, so it did not count. So, what, it wasn't, wasn't he following uh, Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord, one faithful in baptism? Well, guess what? They weren't even saved when they got baptized, so it didn't count. So, if, if, if Paul did it, it's not the same to get baptized if you've never been baptized. And even if you have that, you were baptized, but you have doubts about it. Because you're not sure if the person that baptized you was saved. Okay? Now, I'm not saying you have to get baptized, but I'm saying you're not sinning if you do go get baptized. Because I'm thinking Judas probably baptized some people. Okay? And it's more the, 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 the sign and the seal of what you're showing then who, who does it? But I believe you should get a saved person to do it. But, they, you know, there's people that have gotten baptized and later found out the person was a heretic. You don't necessarily have to get baptized again. But if you've never actually been dumped under the biblical way, you should get baptized. These 12 guys, they got baptized again. They already got immersed, and they were not sinning. Paul, you know, taught them but the Holy Spirit, he, he, he got them saved, and then they got baptized. And so what is baptism? We talked about it. It's, a, it's a showing the, the death, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, just like somebody getting dumped on it. Um, on Thursday, we read through Romans 4, and 
it talks about Abraham getting circumcised, and I think this is a good good verse to teach about baptism as well, because baptism is kind of like the New Testament circumcision. It's, it's a sign of, of being a saved person. Now, a lot of people got circumcised that were never saved, just like a lot of people get baptized that are never saved. And just like circumcision, it isn't something everybody can overly see. Baptism isn't either, except for when it happens. Okay? Romans 4, 11, and he just talked about Abraham. And he received a sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So circumcision was a sign, baptism is a sign. But he was already righteous through faith before he was circumcised. And we're already righteous through faith in Jesus Christ before we're baptized. It's just a sign of baptism. Okay? What does it signify? The death, the burial, and the resurrection. So I hope that that's that helped you to see, you know, that it's we should do it out of obedience. Obedience to Christ as he taught it, he taught his disciples to go do it. And that it is not necessary for salvation, but rather if you're saved, you should do it. It's the first step of obedience. And it should be fully immersed. The Bible's clear about that. And, and let's not look down on people that are still not sure about this. Because, you know, it took me a while after I got saved to, um, to get over this, this ingrained thing about you're doing wrong if you get baptized. And that's why I think it took me like uh, maybe two years after or so after I got saved that I got baptized. Because I had to get this clear in my head. But, you know, listening to sermons about this is good. And then you can see, yeah, you know, the Bible teaches it's fully immersed. Because you're, in the likeness of his death, you're planted. And then, like his resurrection, you're brought up out of the water again. So, let's pray. Thank you, God, for salvation. Thank you for making it free. Thank you for saving so many people. And uh, just work in anybody's heart here that is not baptized. And that they'll they will get baptized, and that they won't have any doubts about it when they do get baptized, because you, your word is clear on immersion, and it's clear um, that those 12 people got baptized again, even though John baptized them. And help this congregation grow, not just in numbers, but also spiritually. Um, teach us every day, help us read our Bibles, and to understand it, and to love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.